Hi, I'm Dave Larson, Editor-in-Chief here at We Talk Nerdy TV. Over the past few weeks, I've created a series of shows as an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. I cover everything from what it is, to how to set it up for the first time, to using the Pi to control an external circuit with the GPIO pins. Here now are all three segments in one video. Thanks for watching. If you like We Talk Nerdy TV, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our website, or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. We Talk Nerdy. In this week's how-to segment, I want to give you an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. As you probably figured out by now, the Raspberry Pi is not a dessert. It's a credit card, credit card sized single board computer developed in the United Kingdom uh, by the Raspberry Pi Foundation with the intention of promoting the teaching of basic computer science in schools. It's available for as little as $35. And at that price, this is a terrific bargain. The version I have here is a Pi Model B. It has two USB ports, composite and HDMI video out, stereo out, 512 megs of RAM, and a 10100 Ethernet port. Both uh, the A and B models are based on a 700 megahertz uh, ARM processor, and there are a number of operating systems that you can run on it, uh, the most common being Linux. Uh, according to Wikipedia, there are also versions of the Chrome OS and Android uh, that are either available now or will be coming soon. Uh, there are a few other neat options coming uh, soon, like the GERT board, uh, which is designed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation people. And it's designed also for educational purposes, and it expands the Raspberry Pi's uh, GPIO pins, which are these pins right here, uh, and that allows the Pi to interface with and control um, LEDs, switches, analog signals, um, sensors, and other devices. It also includes an optional Arduino compatible controller, uh, which is great news for people who uh, like messing around with this kind of electronic kit. Um, there's also a camera in the works, and recently the folks at Raspberry Pi Foundation have uh, opened an app store uh, that offers games, apps, development tools, and tutorials uh, that are for download. Um, many of them are free, and uh, I think this is a really great uh, little computer, especially um, for you know, teaching your kids about computers. It's very basic. Um, but it's really ideal and they can be completely hands-on with it. Um, this little computer has about as much phone, uh, sorry, has about as much power as say a slightly older cell phone. Um, it's pretty amazing for such an inexpensive computer. Um, and again, if you have kids that are interested in computers, I think this is a great thing to have. It's powerful enough that they can learn about computers, uh, programming, and even robotics with the Arduino. Um, it's inexpensive enough to replace it if they break it. And uh, like I said, I think this is an awesome, awesome thing to have around. Now, big question is, what can you do with it, right? Well, as I mentioned, it's a decent platform for learning about computers and programming. Um, most of the installations, as far as I know, um, uh, come with uh, the Python programming language. So if you're into it, you can teach your kids about Python programming. Um, there's lots of people out there using the Raspberry Pi as a digital media center. Um, you can download and install Xbox Media Center on this. Um, you can also use it as a controller for a network attached storage device. Heck, I've even got pictures here of a guy who uh, made a bicycle light with a speed indicator using a Raspberry Pi. As for me, uh, I'm going to use my Raspberry Pi as an inexpensive, always-on BitTorrent server. Um, this is perfect for me. Um, I can uh, use it to serve uh, We Talk Nerdy TV episodes over BitTorrent. I can have it always on. Um, and uh, I'm in the process of getting that set up right now. Um, I've been doing some testing, and according to my trusty little kilowatt, it says that I'm using a peak power of nine watts 
and averaging about six watts or so um, when it's connected to the internet. Um, once I have it set up and working reliably, I'll be able to provide an always-on BitTorrent feed for anyone who wants to download We Talk Nerdy uh, over BitTorrent, and it won't cost me very much in electricity. Uh, nine volts, is, or sorry, nine watts is very reasonable uh, power drain. So when you buy a Raspberry Pi, this is what you get. That's it. So you might want to think about what else you're going to need in order to make it work. At the minimum, you're going to need an SD card because that's what the operating system runs off of. I think the smallest one that will still work is a two gigabyte. Um, I'm using a four gigabyte and I think that is generally the recommended size. Um, bigger is better. If you can get a eight gig uh, SD card, that would be even better. Um, and generally speaking, you should try to get one uh, that's a class 10 uh, SD card. Those are the faster ones. Um, you're also going to need a video cable, either HDMI or composite video. Uh, I have one that is HDMI on one end and DVI on the other so that I can hook it up to my monitor because my monitor doesn't have an HDMI cable input. You'll probably also want to get a little USB power adapter uh, with a micro USB cable to provide the power. Um, if you have a lot of electronics, you will probably have some of these lying around. Uh, and you may also want to get a powered USB hub. The Model B comes with um, two USB ports. The Model A only has one. Um, and neither one of them provides a whole lot of power. A powered USB hub lets you connect a bunch of USD, USB devices uh, without having to draw too much power off the Pi itself. Um, I have a 10 port model that I'm using, um, but you probably don't need quite that much. It's a little overkill. Of course, you're also going to need a USB keyboard and a mouse. And finally, you might want to consider getting a case of some kind. Now, there are some cardboard designs out there that you can download and print out um, on your printer and make yourself. There's also some plastic ones that you can purchase uh, for just a few dollars. Um, I bought some chocolates while I was in Belgium last fall, and I've been saving the tin for just such an occasion. It's the perfect size for a Raspberry, cake, a raspberry Pi case, and here's how I did it. First of all, since it's a metal case, I needed to figure out how to keep the Pi from touching the case, lest I short circuit something. Now, I could put some kind of insulating material between the circuit board and the tin, but I thought using standoffs would be a nicer looking and provide for better cooling. A standoff is just a little metal cylinder that can be screwed together with the circuit board to provide space between the case and the board. You can buy these fairly cheaply at Radio Shack or some other electronic supplier. Once I laid out where I wanted the Pi within the case, I used a Sharpie to mark some cut lines. Then it was a simple matter of drilling some holes for the cables and cutting some openings with a Dremel tool and a cutting disc. Once you cut the holes, be sure to use a grinding wheel of some kind to get rid of any metal shavings or sharp edges. The whole process took about an hour or so. And there you have it. It's a very nice little home for my Raspberry Pi. Well, that's it for this week. In last week's how-to, I gave you an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. I explained what it is, what you can do with it, and the kinds of accessories you're going to need if you want to make use of one yourself. I also, sh I also showed you how I hacked an old chocolate tin with a drill and a Dremel tool to make a simple case for my Pi. This week, I'd like to show you how you can get up and running with your own Raspberry Pi and how I'm using mine as a low-power, always-on BitTorrent server. I'm going to show you some more resources that you can use to expand the capabilities of your Pi. But first, if you're looking to get a Raspberry Pi, I have to warn you, you might have a little trouble finding one. Apparently, there was a recent shipment of new Raspberry Pis, uh, especially the $25 uh, Model A, and it's sold out right away. There seems to be a few of the $35 Model Bs available, and I would suggest the Model B over the Model A anyway, 
since it has twice the memory and two USB ports instead of one. When I checked the website of www.newark.com, one of the official resellers of the Raspberry Pi in the US, they had 20 units in stock. You can also get a Pi from unofficial resellers on Amazon, but they might be as expensive as $45. Still, not too expensive considering what you get. So I'm gonna assume that you have your Pi hardware all ready to go and that you're ready to install the operating system. Fortunately, this is really pretty easy, uh, but you do need to use another computer in order to get it started. The Raspberry Pi Foundation recommends something called Raspbian Wheezy. I know that sounds like a weird name, uh, but that's the name of the um, beginner's version of the operating system for Raspberry Pi. It's a version of Debian Linux and it's optimized specifically to work for your Pi. It includes a graphical user interface, a web browser, uh, some other time-wasting programs, um, and Python. Uh, there's lots of other programs you can down to go with it, download to go with it, uh, and when you're ready to get started, head to www.raspberrypi.org slash downloads. Raspy and Wheezy can be downloaded directly, or if you have BitTorrent, you can download it probably a little bit quicker via BitTorrent. The file is 471 megs, so it's reasonably large, and it took me about 10 minutes. If you're using Windows, you're also going to need to use a program called Win32 Disk Imager to write the Raspy and Wheezy image to an SD card. Once you've downloaded both of those files, I suggest you copy them into the same directory and extract the zip file. That way you'll have all the files in one directory. Now, something that I haven't mentioned until now is that you need to have some sort of a SD card reader slash writer in order to put the data on the card. I have a simple USB uh, card reader. You just plug in the USB card into the slot and plug the device into the nearest USB port and you're ready to go. Now go ahead and mount the SD card and when you run the Win32 Disk Imager program it'll allow you to choose and locate the image file and pick the drive letter of the SD card. In my case the SD card is mounted as drive H and when you're ready to go just hit the right button to start copying the image to the SD card. This process takes a few minutes, and when you're done, you're ready to start your Raspberry Pi for the first time. So put the SD card into the Pi, and if all goes well, your Raspberry Pi should boot up, and you'll be presented with the Pi configuration screen. Uh, the configuration screen pops up the very first time you boot your Raspberry Pi, but it won't pop up after that. There are a few options on the configuration screen, including keyboard setup and even some overclocking options. Once you've made your choices, the Pi will boot to the desktop, and this will look very familiar to any of you who are Windows users. There's a start menu of sorts in the lower left-hand corner, and it lets you start a graphical file browser or the built-in web browser. There's also a few nifty time-wasting programs pre-installed on the desktop, and you can have fun messing around with those. And as I mentioned last week, there's also a Raspberry Pi store. And if you visit the store, you can download all sorts of different programs. Some of them are for free, and some of them are paid. Uh, there's games and all sorts of learning programs. Check it out and uh, see what you think. Now, if you feel like you made a mistake when you uh, adjusted your configuration file, you can reopen that configuration program at any time uh, and you type sudo raspy-config and that will open the configuration file back up and you can make changes as much as you like. So what you might want to do is experiment with overclocking a little bit, see if you can get your Pi to run a bit faster. Uh, and if you end up having crashes or instability, then I would recommend that you um, put the clock it's a system clock back the way it was. By the way, one of the most useful options is called expand underscore root FS. Um, this is a good thing to access from the configuration menu um, because the way Raspbian Pi or Raspbian Wheezy is installed, it creates a two gigabyte file system on your little SD card. 
Uh, now, if your SD card is four gigabytes or eight gigabytes, that means you're not being able to use all of the space that's available. Uh, if you run this configuration option, uh, any remaining space on the um, SD card will be accessible to you, and now you can use the full potential of your SD card. So if you have a four gig SD card, uh, the the file system will increase from two gigs to four gigs and so on. Keep in mind that pre-installed software on uh, the Pi is kept to a minimum. If you had had a bunch of pre-installed software on there, your download of 471 megs would have been much larger. So they leave it up to you to install any extra programs that you might need. Fortunately, Raspbian is linked to the Debian ARM HF repositories, uh, so you have access to more software than you're ever really going to need. Now, if you're new to Linux in general, you may want to install a graphical package manager. Packages are the way that you get software uh, on Linux, uh, and typically there's a simple command line option for doing this, but you can also use a graphical package manager like Synaptic. To install it, you type sudo apt-get install synaptic. Uh, do that in a terminal window, and uh, then it can later be opened by going to the LXDE menu, preferences, and then synaptic package manager. Then you can install any software you want. And uh, it's really easy to work with different packages. You can download uh, whatever package, um, you know, strikes your fancy and try it out. And if you don't like it, you can very easily uninstall it as well. Something else that's great about the Raspberry Pi is that since the operating system is on an SD card, and since SD cards are relatively inexpensive, you can buy several different SD cards and try out different operating systems. You can get uh, not just the Raspbian Wheezy, but you can get something called Arch. You can get... Um, Chromium OS. I know that Android is in the works. It's not ready yet. Um, there's also a version of Puppy Linux, which we talked about a couple shows ago, and you can get that for the Raspberry Pi as well. Uh, and if you make a separate SD card for each of these operating systems, you can experiment with all of them and see what you like the best. It's a really great way of experimenting with all these different things and finding out what works for you. Now, before I go, I want to direct you to a couple of other great resources. The first one is called Adafruit, and its uh, web address is learn.adafruit.com. Now, it may seem a bit intimidating at first, but Adafruit has a ton of great resources for makers. There are how-to articles on everything from Raspberry Pi to Arduino to do-it-yourself wearable computing projects. Also, check out www.makershed.com. Here you can find kits, electronics projects, and how-tos for Raspberry Pi, and a whole range of Arduino-based projects. Now, I'd like to do a little self-promotion here, if I may. If you're a fan of we Talk Nerdy TV, and you'd like to help me pay the bills and get some great swag in the process, please visit our shop where you can order cool wetalknerdy.tv stuff. Everything from t-shirts and hoodies to pins, bumper stickers, and coffee mugs. There are hundreds of items available and each can be customized in a multitude of colors and sizes. And you'd be doing me a great favor and I would be most grateful. And now it's time for part three of my series on the Raspberry Pi. Today, I'm going to show you how to control an LED with the Pi. And now I realize that this is not an amazing project or anything, but remember the Raspberry Pi was developed as an educational platform. This example project is a good first step that nearly anyone can do. Even if you have no interest in electronics or programming, I'm hoping that you will find this enlightening. Uh, when you see how easy this is, perhaps you'll be inspired to try a project of your own. Now, to begin, we need our Raspberry Pi all set up and ready to go as I explained in part two of this series. 
I'm going to proceed based on the assumption that you've already installed Raspbian and Wheezy on your Pi. Now, naturally, you're going to need an LED, uh, a, some wire, uh, a resistor, and a soldering iron and or a breadboard uh, for making the circuit. A breadboard, like the one I have here, is a simple and inexpensive tool for creating, testing, and prototyping circuits. You can purchase all of these parts, including the breadboard, uh, for just a few dollars at a store like Radio Shack or from an online retailer. If you don't have a breadboard, you can solder the wires together or even just connect them, twist them together and connect them with tape. In this example, I'm going to use this breadboard uh, because it makes things really easy. Now, if you've never used a breadboard before, the horizontal holes are connected together on either side of a central dividing line while the holes on the far left and right are connected vertically. This is for powering the circuit and it's called a bus strip. Making a circuit is as simple as pushing a wire into the appropriate hole. Now, step one is to take a look at the Raspberry Pi and identify what are called the GPIO pins. The GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output. These pins are what we can use to get input from other devices, like thermal sensors, for example, and we can use them to switch on and off our LED. There are two sets of 13 pins, 26 pins in all. With the SD card at the top and the USB connector at the bottom, as you look down on the Pi, the odd numbered pins are on the left and the even numbered pins are on the right. This pin diagram comes courtesy of Matt from the Raspberry Pi Spy website. Unfortunately, the pins are organized in a somewhat confusing fashion. For the sake of simplicity, I'm going to refer to the pins by number. For this example, we're going to be using pins 9, 11, and 17. Now, if you have an old IDE cable around, you could connect that to the pins. Um, but in order to make things as obvious as possible, I went ahead and I soldered uh, little wires to those pins. That way you can see exactly which pins are connected to what part of the breadboard. Normally, uh, you would want to use different colored wires, but since I only had green wire, I taped little labels to each wire so I wouldn't get them confused. This is important because if you connect the wrong wires together, you could short out and possibly ruin your Raspberry Pi. You obviously don't want to do that. Now, before we try to write a program to turn on the LED, I want to start by setting up a test circuit. My goal here is to wire up an LED directly to the Raspberry Pi and make sure that it comes on. That way, once I write my program to make the LED blink, I'll know that the circuit is working ahead of time. Once I've got that working properly, I'll move on to the next step. When we look at our pin diagram, I can see that pin nine is our ground wire. If it helps, you can think of that as minus. And pin 17 is our plus three volt wire. To start, I'm going to connect those wires to the breadboard and see if I can get the LED to glow. But I have a slight problem. My LED runs off of 2.1 volts, not 3.3, which is what the Raspberry Pi produces. So in order to reduce the voltage, I'm going to use a small resistor. A resistor, like the name implies, resists the flow of electricity. Resistance is measured in ohms, and the resistor I have here is a 470 ohm resistor, which is actually a little bit too much, but for the sake of this project, it'll work just fine. All you really need to know is that it's important to use a resistor with each LED in your circuit. You can use anything from 100 ohms to 470 ohms, and it should work just fine. Uh, again, you can get resistors at Radio Shack or some other online retailer. Okay, moving on. So all I have to do is plug the wires into the breadboard, and when I turn on the Raspberry Pi, the LED should start to glow. If it doesn't, 
you might have the LED in backwards. Unlike the resistor, the LED needs to be hooked up the right way around. Otherwise, it won't work. So if I turn it around and then it glows, I know I had it in backwards. So now we have a working circuit. This is great, but we want to be able to control the LED, not just have it come on whenever we turn on the Pi. So I, we need to change this circuit slightly. Instead of connecting the LED to pins 9 and 17, we want to connect it to pins 9 and 11. Pin 11 is the pin that we're going to program to come on and off. So I'm going to unhook 17 and put 11 in its place. Now when I turn on the Raspberry Pi, the LED does not come on right away. So now we can write a program in Python to turn it on. Now Python is a powerful programming language and it's included with the Raspberry Pi. Before we can write that program though, we need to install some Python development software. Don't worry, it's really easy and I'll show you exactly how to do it. Start up your Raspberry Pi, open a terminal window and type sudo apt-get install python-dev. Now let me explain what this does. Sudo means run the next command as superuser. SU for superuser and DO as in do this. Sudo. APT is a program called the Advanced Packaging Tool and you're telling it to get some software and install it. In this case we want to get the Python development tools. APT is smart enough to know what to do all you have to do is tell it what you want. And of course, you have to be connected to the internet for APT to be able to find and download the software for you. Once you have installed the Python developer tools, you need to get your hands on the Raspberry Pi GPIO library. This is just extra software that Python needs in order to be able to make use of the GPIO pins. There's no package for this, you need to download it and install it manually. But again, this is really simple. Here's what you do. Simply start up Midori, which is the Raspberry Pi web browser. You should find a link to it uh, right next to the start, but where the start button would be if this was Windows, but on Linux, it's in the lower left-hand corner. There's a little button that starts up Midori. You can also start it from the terminal window if you choose. And uh, go to this URL. Click the green button to download the library. Midori will download a file called rpi.gpio. There's some numbers, it's a version number, and the file ends in .tar.gz. Now, by the way, this is called a tarball, and it's the Linux equivalent of a zip file. Uh, and just like a zip file, you need to be able to extract the contents in order to be able to use them. You can use a terminal window or you can use the file browser. Either way, once you have extracted the files from the tarball, use this command, sudo python setup.py install. This command tells Python to install the library files. We're almost there. Now we're ready to program. I'm a novice Python programmer myself, so I have a program here written by Rahul Carr from the Raspberry Pi blog. It makes the LED blink 50 times. It's a really simple program. It's only 17 lines. So let's take a quick look at it and see what it does. The first two lines import modules that we need in order to make the program work. Lines three through nine define a function called blink. Line five sets the GPIO pin to high. In other words, turns on the current. Line six tells the program to sleep for one second. Then line seven sets the GPIO pin to low, which turns off the current. And then line eight makes the program sleep again for one second. So the blink function turns the LED on, waits, turns it off, and then waits again. Really simple. At the bottom of the program, there's a loop function. Line 15 through 16 says to Python to blink the pin 50 times. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Let me show you 
how to copy this program and run it on your Raspberry Pi. First, you're going to want to open a ter terminal window on your Pi and then type sudo nano blink50.py. Again, sudo runs a program called nano as a super user. Nano is a text editing program that we can use to save our Python uh, script. Next, uh, you want to copy the program from either my show notes on the We Talk Nerdy TV website, or you can copy it from the Raspberry Pi blog. Once you've done that, right click in the terminal window and choose paste from the pop-up menu. This should paste a copy of the program into Nano. If you want, you can mess around with editing it in Nano as well, but for this first run through, just leave it the way it is and go ahead and press Control X to exit and then press Y to save the program as blink50.py. If you type ls in the terminal window, you should now see a file called blink50.py in your directory. Now, you're all set to go. All you have to do is run the program. And in order to do that, you're gonna type sudo python blink50.py. That will run the, or run the script that we just created with Nano. And if all goes well, the LED attached to your Raspberry Pi should blink 50 times and then stop. Now, this is a great time to experiment. You can try changing the program to make the LED blink faster or slower. Don't be afraid to mess around with it. 50 is kind of a lot of numbers of loops. It's gonna take uh, almost two minutes to go through that cycle. So you might wanna make it say 10 uh, blinks instead of 50. Well, congratulations. You've completed your first Raspberry Pi project. As I said at the outset, this is a simple example uh, for beginners. Blinking in LED is not an earth shattering project, but this is really just meant to open your eyes and help you get started. From here, for example, you could replace the LED uh, and then you could use a uh, small uh, electronic module called a relay. And then you could use the Pi to turn on and off, uh, say, other devices at certain times of the day. Or you can learn about how to receive input from other modules. Um, like, for example, uh, you could turn on and off some device based on temperature. There's a lot more you can do with the Raspberry Pi, and I've given you some, some links to other examples in show notes before, um, so check on those. And I hope I've got you started with your Raspberry Pi, and hopefully I'm sending you off in a good direction. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Next week, I want to show you how to replace the battery on a iPhone. I hope you'll tune in for that. And remember, if you have questions or problems and you need answers, visit us at wetalknerdy.tv and leave a comment in the comment section or send us an email at wetalknerdy.tv at gmail.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next Monday. This is so nice, sir.